Welcome to Strange Familiars, and Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy whatever winter holiday you celebrate. This will be the first of at least two Christmas shows we're doing this month. We're going to be talking about the Christmas Scarecrow tonight. Before we get going with that, I want to thank our patrons. Thank you so much, patrons. You make Strange Familiars possible. Without you, we could not do the show. Tis the season, and if you'd like to help us make Strange Familiars becoming a patron or giving the gift to someone else of Strange Familiars patronage is a wonderful way to help the podcast continue. Patreon.com slash Strange Familiars is where you sign up. All of our patrons get extra content. We do two full patron episodes every month for our patrons. Sometimes we do even more. Go ahead and check it out at patreon.com slash strange familiars. All right. I'm going to thank Chad for calling my attention to this character, this Christmas scarecrow. He sent me a message. Have you ever heard of this guy? I'm like, what? what Christmas scarecrow? I have to look into this. And it's quite wonderful. So you know there are many, many Christmas wild men, Allison. Apparently. Can you name any Christmas wild men? Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> um, I, Scrooge McDuck was just a duck, right? He wasn't even particularly Christmas related. He just happened to have the name Scrooge. That wasn't like a Christmas special. No, that's he was on all the time, right? Yes, Scrooge McDuck was on all the time. Um, Christmas wild men. Yes. Um. We have one right here in Pennsylvania. Oh, Belsnickel, Krampus. There you um, go. Santa's I mean, just, technically a wild man, but uh, we won't get, you know. Isn't that when the job's over? <laughs> I guess that's a question for Mrs. Claus. <laughs> Can you imagine, though, just flying back when the load is so much lighter than when you started off? Like, how much faster you can get back to the North Pole? Yeah. So the most famous of the Christmas wild men is, of course, Krampus, who's quite trendy these days. There's a lot of a lot of Krampus nights all around. And of course, we did a full show on Pennsylvania's own Belsnickel a couple years back. That was Strange Familiars episode 60, Belsnickel, the Christmas Wild Man. Well, another of these frightening figures is Hans Trapp or Hans von Trapp, sometimes known as the Christmas Scarecrow. He's part of the von Trapp family? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I don't know. Were they from... What region were they from? Well, aren't they supposed to be Austrian? Are they Austrian? Well, Hans Trapp hails from the Alsace region. So that's France's border with Germany and Switzerland. It's not that far away. It's not that far away. I found some articles which describe Hans Trapp's place in the Christmas mumming traditions of the region. Are mummers wild men? Um, you know, mummers certainly often play the wild man aspect, you know, but I don't know if, if so all... So is all of Philadelphia, basically. <laughs> I don't know if all mummers are wild men. This is from the Weekly Standard and Express, Blackburn, Lancashire, England, the 26th of December, 1891. The Christ Child and Hands Trap. 
In some parts of France, they say, the Christ child walks about on Christmas Eve and rings a bell. But, of course, they are only mummers. The Christ child is mostly a tall girl with long fair hair, robed in white, with a golden girdle and a golden crown on which are lighted wax tapers. Her face is painted quite white. On her left arm she carries a basket with sweets, and in her right hand she holds a bell, ringing it as she walks along. Her companion, Hans Trapp, is a terror to the children. He is clothed in a bear skin, which covers him all over. His face is blackened with soot, and he has a long black beard. Over his shoulder he carries a bag with apples and nuts, and in his hand he carries a switch, with which he threatens the children. This strange couple, mostly, are well-known people, and they enter the houses of the rich and poor. The children are frightened at first and creep behind the mother and the father. With a gruff voice, Hans Trapp asks if they are obedient and can say their prayers. They each tell a little verse they generally learn beforehand, and if they can't say it, he runs after them with a switch. But the Christ child steps forward and pleads for the children. They all promise to be good and obedient. Then Hans Trapp throws apples and nuts on the floor, and the Christ child gives the mother sweets for the little ones. And if they are poor, she gives her money and garments. And whilst there is a scramble for apples and nuts, they both disappear. So this next one is from The Carbon Advocate, Leighton, Pennsylvania, December 20th, 1884. In Alsace, the Christmas messenger appears as Lady Bountiful, clad in white, her face powdered with flour. On her long auburn hair, made of tow, she wears a crown of gold paper surrounded with lighted wax tapers, holding in one hand a silver bell and in the other a basket filled with presents. She, too, is supposed to arrive on a donkey and is accompanied by Hans Trapp, the indispensable bugbear, wrapped in bearskins, the blackened face hidden under a slouch hat, and his hands a birch rod. Anxious to conciliate even the donkey, the children place a bundle of hay behind the door for its accommodation, and a glass filled with wine is welcome for the lady and her attendant, singing a quaint old German rhyme which I am not going to repeat. Yeah, you don't have to <laughs> try it. Christ Krindle. Oh, it's like Christ's child, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The explanation of which may serve as an amusement for a holiday afternoon. The proceedings of Hans Trapp are about the same as those of Necht Ruprecht, but the Lady Bountiful intercedes for the naughty children on their promise of amendment and places her gifts under the Christmas tree. This is from the Philadelphia Inquirer, December 7th, 1924. In France, though New Year's is generally observed rather than Christmas for the distribution of gifts, it is the Jesus, Christ child, who comes with a convoy of angels loaded with books, toys, and confectionery with which to fill the expectant little shoes that the tiny hands have so carefully arranged in the fireplace. A young maiden dressed in white with hair of lamb's wool hanging down upon her shoulders and her face whitened with flour while on her head she wears a crown of gilt paper set round with burning tapers, personates him among the peasants of the Alsace. She holds in one hand a silver bell and a basket full of sweet meats in the other. Accompanying this shining presence of loveliness and goodwill goes an ugly masked figure wearing horns and a long beard and carrying a bundle of rods. This latter is Hans Trapp, the Alsatian Ruprecht, and the bugbear of all young folks. Upon entering the house, the unwelcome visitor demands in a hoarse voice how the children have behaved since his last annual visit, asking such questions as, Has Carl learned to like the crust of his pie? Well, the crust is the best part. Come on. Or, you will always argue about that. <laughs> or does Lena turn her toes out yet? Trembling and crying, the little ones seek to escape as best they can from the impending storm. The Christ child now intercedes for them, and upon promising to become better in the future, she leads them one by one to the brilliantly illuminated Christmas tree loaded with presents, when in their joy they speedily become oblivious of the frightful hand's trap. And this last one is from the Danville News, 24th of November, 1989. That's from Danville, Pennsylvania. Hans Trapp. 
a German demon, is another character of this type. He, like the Klaubauf, is bestial in nature. His face is blackened and his outfit is a bearskin. It is the Christkind, rather than St. Nicholas, whom he is believed to proceed on his journey to distribute presents. Needless to say, Hans Tropp's role in the legend is to frighten the children he encounters. This behavior continues until he is sent off by the Christkind's arrival on the scene. Oh, I have one more. This is from the Bedford County Press and Everett Press, Everett, Pennsylvania, 20th of December, 1871. The bad children, as well as the good, are told that Michael the Hairy, or Hans Trap, as he is called in Alsace, will take the disobedient and treat them in a manner horrible for the juvenile mind to think of. I never read that Michael the Hairy name before. I don't advise looking that up on Google, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that Michael the Hairy lives somewhere near Town of Finland. I'm not sure, <laughs> but uh, it was, uh, yeah, th- nothing came up that I wanted <laughs> to see nothing relevant to the research of this. So in these articles, Von Trapp, Hans Von Trapp, is almost identical to Belsnickel. He's Mm -hmm. dressed alike. He has the same role as Belsnickel. He's dressed like Belsnickel. He looks like Belsnickel. He's dressed in furs. He's got the switch and the candies and, and nuts and stuff for the kids. Kind of a good cop, bad cop kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. But he accompanies this Christ kind, as they say, the Christ child, which is odd because it takes the form of a woman in white. Yeah. That that Christ is. Yeah. It's symbolically the woman in white. Yeah. But it's another wild man accompanying a woman in white. I wrote a whole chapter in Where the Footprints End One, and it just continues. I just keep finding more and more wild men and women in white, they go together. I will note, once again, I believe I've shown this previously in both the Belsnickel episode and in my research for Where the Footprints End, when they talk about blackened faces of these Christmas wild men, I don't think it has originally it had anything to do with blackface. These customs predate American minstrel shows, so they weren't, you know, quote unquote, doing blackface. That said, you know, these days, got to be real careful with that stuff. And I think if I was dressed as Belsnickel, I would avoid that part of the costume, you know because culturally it has come to mean something else. But just as I read these articles, you know, it's not people being, quote unquote, in blackface. This is mm-hmm. part of the wild man costume that, that predates, you know, American minstrel shows. I believe, honestly, these were based on like trying to look like wild men, not on any kind of like racist trope or anything. But that was then and this is now. So. Can we also talk about how incredibly dangerous it would be to wear a paper crown covered With in candles? candles? Yeah. He's just a walking, literally a walking fire hazard. I, when we were kids, there was I have about four happy memories from elementary school, and one of them included a, a year we did Christmas around the world. And I have a recollection that there is, is there like a Scandinavian or Swedish girl that dresses up with the candles on her head? I would guess. I mean, all these traditions are so interwoven, and they just they just kind of take. You know, like a little bit. Yeah, you yeah. can see like parts of other stories in each one we read. There, are, It's almost like a, a little passion play comes to your house every year and yeah. works itself out in the living room as you get candy. Yeah. So how Hans Trap became the Christmas wild man for the region. I'm not sure because there's this other folklore associated with him that that isn't very Christmassy exactly. He has a kind of origin story, which goes like this. Hans Trapp lived in the Alsace region sometime in the 1400s. He was known as a vicious, strong, and wealthy man. Apparently not content with the riches and power he already had, he made some kind of deal with the devil. And the Pope got word of his satanic dealings. He was summoned to Rome. He was tried and excommunicated. He returned home to find his wealth and his property confiscated, leaving him poor and homeless. So in this wretched state, Trapp fled to the Bavarian mountains. He built a rustic hut in which he brooded on his fate. Whether by intention or evil hunger, Trapp resorted to cannibalism, disguising himself as a scarecrow to fall upon unsuspecting victims impaling them on a barbed pole and dragging them back to his hut 
where he would dismember them and roast them on the fire. Kind of worse than Belsicle by far. This guy's a cannibal, you know. Yeah. He's, he's, That's next level. Yeah. So apparently these compounded sins were at last too much for God, who struck Han's trap with a bolt of lightning, killing him. However, his spirit would not rest, and he still roams the mountains dressed as a scarecrow and seeking lonely wanderers for midnight snacks. So is the bolt of lightning responsible for the sooty appearance? I hadn't even thought about that. It could be. And then from there, Hans Trapp like, seems to join the ranks of these Christmas wild men. Do you think he's being punished for using his wealth in a negative way? Yes, or, or for being greedy. Yeah. The thing is, he's at least partially based on a real person, a knight named Hans von Trotha. Hans von Trotha was born in 1450, or thereabouts. They're not exactly sure of his birthday. I'm thinking when we're going back that far, it's, you know, 30 years, give or take, is probably not going to be that consequential. He was the son of a wealthy aristocrat. His older brother would go on to become the Bishop of Merzburg. Hans von Trotha, very interesting. This is the 1400s. Grew to be an impressive height, almost six and a half feet tall in the 1400s. That's pretty tall back then. Yeah, it's very tall back then. And he enters the circles of Alsatian aristocracy at an early age. Just based on the height? <laughs> no, because he was born into a rich family. Oh, yeah, you know. yeah, that'll do it. By 1480, he was awarded hereditary fiefs, two castles. One of these castles was Bervartstein. I may have that pronounced wrong. And Hans von Trotha was awarded this castle, quote, including its belongings, which included some other land. He expanded and reinforced the castle, and it was said to be impenetrable. The way the castle was situated in the land and, and the improvements he made to it, they said that this castle was like literally impenetrable. The problem with the castle was it was contested land. The property originally belonged to the Benedictine monks of Weissenberg Abbey. Henry, the abbot of this group of monks, felt that the officials who awarded Hans von Trotha the castle had no right to do so. Basically, the abbey had sort of entrusted the property to the officials there in Alsace, and the officials, you know, however these things go, like awarded this property then to this Hans von Trotha. And then the monks were like, well, now we want it back, or we gave the property to you to hold in trust. We didn't give it to you to give away, you know. So these issues escalated and Hans dammed the Wieslauder River in order to deprive the town of Weissenberg of water. The abbot complained because the abbey was in Weissenberg. So Hans tore down the dam, which then causes a flood in Weissenberg, which wrecked the town and wrecked its economy. So from this point, Hans von Trotha basically engages in open warfare against this abbey. I couldn't find a lot of information about these battles that go on, like mm -hmm. how this open warfare. But the abbot appeals to the emperor, and he couldn't get Hans to stop. Finally, the abbot turns to Rome, and there's one pope in Rome. I think he dies, and he's replaced by another pope. And finally, eight years later, Hans von Trotha is summoned by Pope Alexander VI to Rome. But instead of going to Rome... To answer for his actions, he replies with a letter which accuses the Pope of uh, immorality. That doesn't sound like a good idea. It didn't work out too well for him. So he was excommunicated, stripped of his properties and titles. But, you know, things change, but they don't change all that much. He was still from a wealthy family. So, as is the case with wealthy people from wealthy families, he landed on his feet. He's appointed to the French royal court where he is eventually knighted by King Louis the Seventh, And I believe he dies. After he dies, the excommunication is posthumously lifted. He's buried in some church. I guess you can go visit his grave. But he had entered the sort of folk consciousness in the Alsace region. They didn't remember him too fondly there. And he becomes Hans Trapp, also known as the Black Knight. So I don't know if... This is like the Black Knight when people talk about the Black Knight, if this is the origin of that story, if this is just one of many Black Knights. Hans Trotha becomes Hans Trapp, 
and becomes this other Christmas wild man. It does seem with the amount of wild men roaming around, Christmas must be sort of a liminal space. It very much is. It very much is. It's in Where the Footprints End, I call it Christmas time of the wild men. Because, you know, people like to think of Halloween as the time the veil thinning. But this is the, the time of the year with the least amount of light in, in our area, you know, like sure. in the north. Yeah, it's traditionally, I mean, Christmas has always been associated with ghost stories and wild men and, and monsters and, and spookiness of all sorts. And it's only been kind of post-Victorian time where we get the, you know, your smiling Coca-Cola Santa. I would trade even up Coca-Cola Santa for more Victorian Christmas ghost stories, right? Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> heck yeah. I, I, I love the tradition. And, you know, I was, I was needling the Krampus thing a little bit, but uh, I mean, it's so cool to see these, these old traditions kind of being brought back and these sort of wilder elements of Christmas being explored once again. Maybe the, we'll get back to the Christmas ghost story, which is a good trend that has declined over the years. Dickens wasn't the first, certainly, to write a Christmas ghost story. That, that was just one in a long tradition of Christmas ghost stories. Well, next we're going to turn the mic over to... The Riverbend fellas, John and Sam, they have some more talk about some comics we all might be interested in. Hi, John. Hey, Sam. We're back. We're here to talk about uh, two different comics today. Let's get started with uh, the, um, I guess, the headliner, uh, which is um, Black Eyed Kids. Yeah, so this is a comic book from Aftershock Comics, and uh, I was I was actually wanted to look back. I'm not sure if Tim has ever done an episode on Black Eyed Kids. I can't imagine it hasn't been mentioned at some point in the history of all the episodes. Um, but Black Eyed Kids is a weird worldwide phenomenon where children show up at your door at night, knock on your door, ask to be let in. Their eyeballs are solid black, no pupils, and that's pretty terrifying in itself. Um, Do they ask for candy? No, generally they want help and they want you to let them in. And, you know, like there's cases where kids have asked, can we come in? We need to use your phone. We're lost. We need to call for help. So are they selling cookies or newspaper subscriptions or? Not your standard people. People. Papers? (laughs) They got black papers. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of a creepy situation and no one really knows what they are. Over the course of many generations, people have seen these kids and talked about them and warned about them and the idea is that anybody who has said yes come on in and invited them into the house has uh generally met uh an unfortunate end at some point in the future so not immediately no so that's the interesting thing so without giving major spoilers away on this book so this is a series that was written by joe pruitt and illustrated by simon kadransky this series really kind of tries to answer the question is what are these children and we actually find out in this book who they are and what their motivations are and um do you not want to talk about that because it gives too much away i mean pretty much right from the beginning uh they reveal themselves and their motives yeah they're i mean yeah we can give that away their motives are are they're not they're not they're not beneficial they're not positive they generally imply that they're recruiting for the cause and they're trying to turn other children into black eyed kids. And that does happen with one of the characters in the book. What's the cause? Well, according to sort of the, the lead child in um, the story here, they view humans and they refer to themselves as non-humans. They don't specifically throw out the alien word. So we can make some presumptions and maybe that becomes more apparent in future volumes, but they do view humans as, uh he overtly states as cattle and so that the humans on the planet are either going to be um used for energy used for energy as in a food source or used in Slaves, service basically we don't know where it's going but it kind of it kind of centers around one particular family where uh a husband or or a man and his ex-wife um 
she has the kids, uh, the black eyed kids show up, tragedy occurs, and now he has to try to stop them and rescue his daughter who is in the hospital from the injuries from the black eyed kids and his son who has been sort of converted into a black eyed child. Now there's also um, one black eyed kid in this story suffers some pretty severe injury that would kill an average person that yeah. seems to come right back. Right. So yeah, we don't really know the origin of these kids and what they, what they are. What do the, what does folklore say about them? What is the origin of them and what is their purpose? A lot of these stories, as we've mentioned before, um, and of course I'm blanking on all of them right now, but a lot of these stories are, are meant to kind of like keep people in line, right? It's stories you kill, you tell your kids at night so they don't misbehave. This thing will come and eat you if you are rude to your mother kind of thing. So do, is there any kind of like corollary there, like, uh, you know, stories that were told in the old days where if you're misbehave or something, the black eyed kids will come to your home? Well, I think there are. I mean, I think there are really old accounts of people encountering children with black eyes, and I don't remember a lot of them offhand, but most of the stories I'm familiar with are actually way more recent and wouldn't even fall in the category of folklore. That would fall in the category of things contemporary people have seen and experienced. Um, and as far as, like, the main lesson is don't let them in your house. I mean, it, there's obviously, like, a isn't a, don't vampires have to be asked to be? invited in yeah that's a really interesting correlation too the um that's certainly a thing that people say about vampires is they won't come in and they can't come in unless invited and that seems to be the case with the black eyed kids but what their purpose is in real life and what they really want and we, we don't actually know the answer to that so talk a little bit about these actual real contemporary sightings of these black eyed kids and what the consequences have been as far as you know one that comes to mind is there was an incident I think it was a different podcast that I heard heard talk about this. Wait, but... you listen to other podcasts besides Strange Familiars? No, never. No, that's okay. a myth. Um, I was worried for a second. There was another podcast that talked about a case where there was uh, a mother went into a store and their child was um, left in the back seat. And during that time, uh, a child with black eyes came to the car and was knocking on the car and asking to be let in. Um, and the child that was in the car opened the car door and allowed the child to enter. And if memory serves, the mother came out and was really concerned because there was this other child that was in the car, black eyes, really freaky. She made the child get out of the car, drove home really fast. Uh, and I think, again, man, my memory on this one, this particular story is fuzzy, but um Either the mother or the child got sick within the next year and passed away from cancer or something like that. So most of the stories I've heard is generally not like in, in this book that we're reading, these kids come in the house and mayhem ensues and they, you know, knives and real horror story kind of murder, really. But the, the real life scenarios that I've heard of tend to almost as if these kids are, are sort of omens of bad things to come mm. and that when you let them in the house you can expect something bad to happen in the future, whether it's um, imminent or a little farther down the road. So what do you like about this comic? We're looking at, as we said before, volume one, the trade paperback, which collects one through five of the series. What do you like about this comic so far? Just from flipping through it, I was kind of not expecting it to be super great. I was sort of like, eh, it's going to be a mediocre comic. But by the end of the first volume, I was itching and looking forward to reading the second one. I sort of like the character setup. Like I like the the dad who's trying to save his kid there's um i like the fact that there's a lot of unanswered questions and mystery like we have the black eyed kids in this book have kidnapped one woman and her version of being in service to them is that she is going to write and document the end of the human civilization as they are going to bring about um so that's fascinating um not knowing their motivations at one point the father realizes that his ex-wife's ex-husband her first husband i guess had been investigating the black eyed kids and has some sort of conspiracy theory web website about them. And so there's that connection. And now he's off to find him to find out what he knows about it. And it's kind of becoming almost like a, uh, sort of a murder mystery slash what's, what's going on. Um, I'm being distracted by my cat now. He's meowing. And he wants to know too. Yeah. He wants to know too. And yet the thing that I like about it too, is the fact that, the black eyed kids and they address this in the book 
um, like we said before, have been cited and talked about. And so rather than just taking that at face value and kind of spitting that out, they kind of take this in a totally different direction that I didn't see coming. Mm. And it's kind of a fascinating different take on the stories that I've heard. So um, I'll tell you what I like about this, um, or at least I find um, compelling, is uh, the color palette, which yeah. Yeah, from the very beginning is like very dark. And so each page and each panel almost is like you have to squint to almost make out the, the figures and the characters who are silhouettes and shadows. And there are like these sort of like sweeping streaks of like neon blues and greens, which give it some of its life. But really, it's all in shadows. Um, but the main story does come through that there it is like in a lot of ways somewhat formulaic in that like you have this major threat that's growing and it's a threat to human civilization and only a few people know about it and they're trying to warn other people and ultimately these tragedies happen and nobody understands them and there's a lot of time wasted because human beings are generally pretty stupid running around knocking their heads together and not taking action um, when the threat is is really really like on your doorstep literally on your doorstep I've read two and a half volumes of it. I'm in the middle of volume three right now. You know, obviously, I've, I've been interested in it enough to keep going. Uh, the recorder character that you mentioned before, her story is crucial. Um, and uh, her experiences in her past, like I was showing you a moment ago, are, uh, are, are really um, necessary to understand to kind of uh, unlock the mystery of this story. Yeah, it definitely feels like volume one is a lot of setup. It like is. They're laying the foundation of what's happening, what these kids are, and then assembling the cast of characters that are going to deal with it. So we have the family that I mentioned before, the reporter, um, there's a police officer that gets involved. There's the kid who goes to prison. Yeah, there's a kid in prison. It's it's um, Yeah, I'm looking forward to see where it goes. Uh, the other thing I'll mention about this book is that um, the covers of the original series and also of the collections here are by a guy named Francesco Francavilla, mm. who does um, a lot of stuff in the horror genre and has some pretty cool... He has a pretty cool way of, of illustrating that I think is not not very formulaic. He's, he's pretty unique in the industry, I think. And he first came to my attention because he was doing a horror comic for Archie Comics, of all places, um, that was uh, called Afterlife with Archie, where the uh, town of Riverdale becomes beset with the zombie apocalypse and... Jughead becomes a zombie, and Archie has to deal with it. It's, it's actually a pretty great series. Well, Aftershock has another series that is uh, currently ramping up called Bunny Mask, <clears throat> which we're going to look at next. And we've only read the first four issues of it. I don't know how many are out. Well, this is... Uh, my understanding is how this is going to work, is there's four issues, and then it's coming back um, next year for another set of four issues. Almost like this is the first season uh, what, what was your take on this? What did you think? I, I was initially very uh, drawn into it just because it presents something, the scenario of which is, we don't know what's real. Uh, and there seems to be like a major traumatic event which takes place right at the beginning uh, in the first issue. And then the time the, the time frame shifts and certain characters know about this event and certain characters don't. And that kind of juxtaposition and tension of like the whole, like, you know, abduction by aliens kind of scenario where it's like I know that this thing happened to me and everyone else is like no it didn't uh serves as kind of like the the linchpin for the story and the major and the main character here is is struggling with his own sanity um after this event takes place which he witnesses and then goes on with his life he's he's his life is saved he goes on with his life but what happened he doesn't know um the local um Law enforcement agents don't seem to understand what's happening. Um, and then there's this hint that there's something real about what transpired, that it wasn't some hallucination through this character who's an artist who draws bunnies and mm -hmm. sculpts bunnies. And if you thought that bunnies were cute and cuddly and sweet, you're wrong. So this is another one more thing. When, when I first saw this comic, the first thing I thought about was Tim's podcast because we've talked about... There's been entire episodes on um, bunny man sightings and the motif of the bunny in the supernatural and how that's been an ongoing thing for a very long time. There's even a little segment on one of his episodes where I talk about my own bunny man sighting that uh, my entire family saw. Um, you want to recount that real quick right here? Yeah, I'll go through it again in case others haven't heard it. Um, wow, I'm thinking of my, the ages of my kids. So I want to say about 13, 14 years ago, my kids were probably like five and seven five and eight and we were coming back from 
um, probably my brother's house who lives south of south of York where we are and we're driving up Route 74 uh, well after dark and on the right hand side of the road there are no street lights in this area so the road's pitch black only our headlights are illuminating the way forward and we pass a giant yard or field on the right hand side and what we see there is sitting in a chair uh, presumably a man in a bunny costume um, waving as the cars go by in this case only our car and uh, again total darkness but he is illuminated somehow as if he has a spotlight on him of course it's easter right so it makes sense i wish it were easter and that simple but no um random time of year random bunny man in a random field on a random road it was pretty pretty crazy well route 74 is well known for its bunny man sightings so it's, it's known for it is known for other sightings but as far as i know that was the only bunny that popped up it was so weird like we also that we slowed down a little bit it was like do we slow down or speed up like <laughs> <laughs> um, but the kids were like, whoa, like, what is that? And, uh, you sure this was not a collective hallucination? I mean, all things are possible, I believe. But, um, if it was, it was certainly collective because we all saw it and recounted it and it was, it was neat and freaky. You think it was a guy just pulling your leg, like out there just being freaky? I think it could have entirely just been a guy who was, who had a bunny suit. He pulled out of storage and was like, oh, let me do this. It'll be really fun. So um, there's no malicious intent. I, you know, there's certainly... In the general, I didn't. It didn't feel malicious. It just felt weird. In the world of high strangeness, does the bunny man carry with him malicious intent? Is he violent? Is he? Is he? Is well, he a lot of the bloodthirsty? a lot of the bunny man sightings I've heard of tend to be tend to seem like situations where not necessarily supernatural, just a bunny in a weird spot. Like generally, looks like someone in a costume at an odd time of year in an odd placement, and it's just odd. Um, and I've heard of other sightings where um, it's almost like a screen. I don't know if you've heard the concept of a screen where, you know, maybe an alien or presumed other other being would appear. But uh, in order to make themselves understandable, they would put a screen on and appear as something. And so what's more um, peaceful and calming than a bunny? So I don't know. Bunnies can be vicious. Certainly the case in this comic that we're reading. Um, yeah. So in the case of the comic, this bunny is... Um... I don't know that she's entirely malicious because at least in her relationship with the main character, there's um, kind of a protective thing happening there. And uh, she saves his life as far as we understand it in that first issue. Yeah. And then, you know, their relationship, we won't say too, too much more about it, but their relationship kind of grows from there. And and she has healing abilities. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's it's unclear who she is or where she comes from. Um, but in the initial meeting place, she's like, it's really unclear. I mean, so the, the bunny we're talking about is like a young woman for lack of a better term, an entity who appears to be a young woman wearing a bunny mask. She is, uh, protective and sort of seems to be on his side, but also has drawn a lot of blood so far on the other side of things mm -hmm. when needed to for protection. So, yeah. Um, she's imbued him also it seems I think she's imbued him with certain supernatural abilities like um, hearing people's thoughts uh, which becomes uh, a burden for him yeah. um, later on in, in the later issues but it's really unclear where this is going yeah like the last series we just talked about this seems to be a lot of setup, a lot of laying the groundwork and introducing characters and um, once again I got through it and was sort of uh, itching to read the next session oh you are okay yeah, so I, I enjoyed it. All right. Well, uh, that's what we have for you today. We have two titles from Aftershock Comics. Uh, Black Eyed Kids, which on the cover of you'll see as B-E-K, uh, in, now in trade paperback, one volumes one, two, and three. We also have on the site right now, we actually have the entire series in single issue format, if that's your cup of tea. And Bunny Mask, uh, four, four, four issues of which are out now, and issues five through eight, I guess, will be out in 2022. Yeah, we'll see what form that takes, whether they um, put them out as five through eight or they put it out as a second series starting at one again. We'll have to see. We will have to see. And uh, if you're riding on Route 74, look for John Darby. He'll be sitting there in a bunny, <laughs> in a bunny suit. Thanks, Tim, for lending us the time. See you soon.
You know, people might get puppies for the holidays, Allison. <laughs> they might. They might think, well, now I have this puppy, and now I need help training this puppy. Where would they go for that? I think they would go to 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy. That's right. Do you know where they can find 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy? Sithappens.us. That's right. You look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. They have a relationship-based approach that helps you and your puppy become perfect for each other. They have online sources. They have video lessons. They have a secret Facebook group. One-on-one options are available. 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can help you understand how your dog thinks and apply proactive training methods so you and your puppy can become perfect for each other. No matter what you need help with, potty training, mouthing and biting, fear and nervousness, barking, if the puppy's chewing on things it shouldn't be chewing on, like furniture or shoes, if you need help with crate training, hyperactivity issues, leash training, and more, 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can help you and your puppy become perfect for each other. Absolutely. If you know someone who's got a puppy, I'm sure 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy will be an excellent gift to go along with their puppy that they're getting for whatever winter holidays they're celebrating. 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy, you can find them at sithappens.us. to think of the in this von Trapp as being part of the von Trapp family. <laughs> Doe, a deer, a female deer. It's the von Trapp they never talk about <laughs> on The Sound of Music. <laughs> you gotta be a real jerk to like 700 years later people are like yeah we're gonna talk about you every Christmas. What a jerk you are. I, I didn't even get all like the local legends of that Hans von Trotha or von Trapp. There's there's other local legends about him being responsible for like, I don't know, there's a story about I think him raping a virgin that was bathing in a spring and all this stuff. It's 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 crazy. I think when you have the legend for being that bad, you, bad things are attributed to you whether you do them or not. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. He, he definitely became one of the supernatural bad guys of the area. I'm going to thank John and Sam for helping us out, taking over the mics, and giving us a little extra content for this special extra Christmas episode of Strange Familiars. You can find Riverbend Comics at riverbendcomics.com. While you're there, you can pre-order Department of Truth 15, the variant cover featuring my artwork. I did a Mothman cover for Department of Truth 15 that is only available from Riverbend Comics. Again, check them out at riverbendcomics.com. We will be back with Brother Richard for another Christmas episode coming up. Go ahead and check out our Etsy shop if you want to help support us beyond becoming a patron or if you just want to get a t-shirt or copies of my books or some of my artwork, etc. Our Etsy shop name is Lost Grave. If you type in Strange Familiars, you should see our stuff come up. Happy holidays, whatever winter holiday you celebrate. I hope everyone's doing well, and I hope you're enjoying the extra content we're bringing to you. We'll be back soon with more Strange Familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts, music, books, art, podcasts, and more. Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. You can find more. Purchase music by Stonebreath at stonebreath.bandcamp.com. That's where you can also buy The Witch Cloud, Strange Familiars, Episode 300, Multimedia Project. It's a book. It's a podcast. It's an audio book. There's some music involved, illustrations, and more. Stonebreath.bandcamp.com for The Witch Cloud and more. Strange Familiars is on Facebook, facebook.com slash strangefamiliars, where you can join the Strange Familiars Gathering Group. And we are on Instagram, at Strange Familiars, one word. And you can always find us on the web at strangefamiliars.com.